Please be seated. I don't know if you've heard about it yet, but in case you haven't, I want you to know that you have been invited to the greatest party of all time. The hosts are two creative men named Peter Dean and Michael Ogden, and in 2019, they decided to invite us all, that is, the whole globe full of people, to a party scheduled for June 6, 2269. You heard me correctly. Two and a half years ago, they put down plans for a party 250 years into the future when none of us will still be around to attend. And yet they are quite serious about this party. The creators describe the 2269 project as an outlandish, amb outlandishly ambitious goal designed to remind people today of the bigger picture. Life is short, but history is long. Recognizing the deep affection we have for rituals, stories, and belongings handed down through our families, we are sowing the seed of an idea today that has potential to grow into something spectacular. Your invitation, they say, is to become part of an epic story designed to unfold over centuries. The greatest party of all time is intended to be a celebration independent of nationality, language, religion, or politics. Yet through these Christian eyes of mine, it looks a lot like Advent. Advent is the season that teaches us to be prepared for the coming of Christ. We look back to the incarnation, to Jesus Christ who was born in a manger and who died on a cross. In this love incarnate, God's imagination for our world is revealed more clearly than in any other point in history. Through Jesus, we can see that it is God's desire that the world be reconciled with our creator. Jesus shows us the heart of God and provides the pathway to our salvation. Yet in Advent, the past only serves as a reference point. In Advent, we cultivate the expectation, our anticipation for what God may be doing next. And we look forward with expectation to the time when the divine vision will finally be completed and all creation restored and reconciled. This is the purpose of Advent, to teach us to live as future-oriented people. This is the season to be reminded that our lives must be shaped not primarily by the world in which we live now, but by God's vision for the future of our world, as it will be. We learn to live into God's expectations. So, speaking of an epic story designed to unfold over centuries, today we hearken back to John the Baptist and we gather with him at the Jordan, where our hearts, too, are filled with expectation. And he says to us, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John baptizes us with water for repentance. But Christ completes us with the gift of the Holy Spirit and ultimately by burning away all that is contrary to life. Now John's threatening speech here, you brood of vipers, the axe lying at the root of the tree, all that talk is maybe more than a little disconcerting to us. And so it is important that we understand what he is doing. John is a prophet, which does not make him a fortune teller or a diviner of the future. Prophets are really more ordinary than that. 
and much more important. Like the prophets before him, John is someone who is uniquely in touch with God's vision for the world and therefore is able to interpret the current time right now, revealing where society is failing to align with the divine vision. In other words, prophets are there to warn us about the cliff that we're speeding toward. In his book, The Prophetic Imagination, Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann writes that the prophet has only the hope that the ache of God could penetrate the numbness of history. That the ache of God could penetrate the numbness of history. As a prophet, therefore, John operates primarily out of a sense of yearning that grows with and out of pain. The repentance that John preaches is not a threat. It's a promise. In fact, it is an invitation to let go of the weight of sin that keeps us from running into the embrace of God's love. John may not know precisely the future, but John knows God. So his fire and brimstone preaching is not born out of despair, but out of hopefulness. For John knows that we cannot find our way into God's vision for the world while we continue the same old sinful patterns of fear and retaliation, competition, and self-interest. Before we can get where we are going, before we can get to where God calls us, to where we belong, we have to leave the past behind us. And we have to be able to see where we're going. So this is also the idea behind the 2269 Project. Dean and Ogden's creativity is born out of a challenging Contemporary reality that is too often characterized by short-term thinking. Like prophets, they possess only the hope that the ache for restoration can penetrate the numbness of history. They want to spark a new conversation about a bigger picture. They are staking a bold claim that our hopefulness about the future now may provide some gifts for the generations that will come after us. And they believe that we can all work together towards a better future if we can imagine it first. We have to imagine that the earth can be restored in order to make serious headway fighting climate change. We must be able to imagine that all humans have inherent dignity and worth in order to heal the divisions of racism and prejudice. We need to look into the future and see what it could look like for people to live in peace, live in peace with one another, in order to put an end to our never-ending wars. Before we can get where we are going, we have to repent of our sins, our old ways of living, so that we may leave the past in the past. And then we must look to where it is that we want to go. With the past behind us and the vision for the future ahead of us, that then leaves us with the important question of what we should be doing now, today. The Gospel of Luke tells us that the crowds ask precisely this of John the Baptist, saying, what then should we do? And he had an answer for them. In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Our salvation lies in giving. John calls us to make straight the pathway of our Lord by giving of ourselves. By recognizing where we have abundance and sharing with those who have less and by taking care of those in need. For it is through our giving that we will once again see the vision of God for which we long. 
It is through giving that we begin to turn that vision into reality, to bring the future into the present. The 2269 project might sound fanciful to you, but the founders hope that it, it will be something much more than that. Since none of us now will actually be present in 2269 to see the dream fulfilled, there are two things that the founders ask people to do today to make it come to pass. They have printed an invitation, a uniquely designed poster, which is not cheap, by the way, <laughs> for people to give to one another, to display, to talk about, and then to pass down to their children. They're hoping that with a commitment from every generation that 250 years will be enough time for the whole globe to catch the vision and show up to the greatest party of all time. The second thing they're doing is they're asking everyone to have a gathering or a party every year on June 6th. They're claiming the day not as a holiday to remember an event from the past, but as a day to toast the future and to mark the passage of time and the gradual accomplishments that are leading us toward a brighter tomorrow. They're calling the annual event One Day. As you can probably tell, I'm pretty impressed with the 2269 project. I truly hope some powerful good will come of it, God willing. But it also occurs to me that the ideas here are not new. As Christians, we know that we are part of the long story of God's salvation. Perhaps we don't have a date on the calendar or a poster to put up on our walls, but every gift of love and kindness is the legacy that we leave our children. And they will leave legacies like that to their children and so on. And our ongoing conversation with the word of God builds upon that faithful vision for the world. And every Sunday when we gather to celebrate word and sacrament, we get a foretaste of the kingdom come, knowing that God's will will ultimately be done. So your invitation is this, be a part of your baptismal covenant. Be a part of God's story of salvation. Make history by participating in God's future. Share it and pass it down because these are the gifts of God for the people.